The prophets. This is our outline for the course of, uh, of course, of course. We started out with the place of the prophets, and last week we looked at the introduction to the major prophets and to the longest of the major prophets, the book of Isaiah. Now remember, the difference in major prophets and minor prophets is not importance, but only length. You have 66 chapters in Isaiah, 52 chapters in Jeremiah. When you get down to the minor prophets, uh, the book of the Twelve, as the Jews call them, uh, some of them are less than, you know, some of them are one chapter, a very short chapter at that. So the major prophets um, are Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and in the, the Christian version of the Bible, we include Daniel. In fact, we also include Lamentations, which we're going to talk about today. Although Lamentations and Daniel are both included in the section called the Writings, uh, or the uh, Ketavim in the Hebrew Bible, not under prophets. We'll, we'll, I'll mention that again later and explain it a little bit. So, last week, major prophets of Isaiah. This week, we're going to talk about the prophet Jeremiah and the book of Lamentations. Let me explain this right now while we're doing these two together. The Book of Lamentations had, in long history past, had been identified as being written by Jeremiah, because it is uh, Lamentations is five laments, or um, if you will, sort of poems of, of weeping and wailing and grief. Sort of, it's sort of like five blues songs. Okay, it's the best analogy we have for today. Um, and each, all of them have to do with the destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonians, by Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian army. Traditionally, since that's exactly what Jeremiah is talking about in the book of Jeremiah, traditionally Lamentations was attributed to him. Very few scholars today, I think, uh, believe that, that Jeremiah probably wrote Lamentations. It doesn't say in Lamentations who wrote it. There's no, no author assigned to it. Uh, in the same way, tradition has it that, that Jeremiah the prophet was responsible for First and Second Kings. Well, there, uh, most scholars today don't think he probably wrote First and Second Kings, but rather it was written by somebody else around the same time. That's not to diminish the veracity or the, the importance of First and Second Kings or Lamentations. It just means that you know we <coughs> don't know for sure who wrote them. Uh, it could have been Jeremiah, but it's less likely. There, there are themes in Lamentations that are consistent with Jeremiah, but um, that's because they're talking about the same stuff and uh, the same events in history, and so there would naturally be some occurrence. The language and other aspects of Lamentations doesn't really match up very well with the writing of the book of, of Jeremiah. So we, we, either way though, in the Christian Bible, Jeremiah and Lamentations are listed together. Lamentations is listed in the Christian Bible, not in the Hebrew Bible, as being part of the prophetic writings. And so we're going to look at both of those today. Okay? In the same way that next week, we're going to look at Ezekiel and Daniel. Daniel is not considered a prophetic writing in the Hebrew Bible either. It's considered a writing. And that's because Daniel is very, we'll talk next week, it's a very complex book. Part of it seems like a book of, of one of the prophets. Part of it's apocalyptic, like the book of Revelation. Uh, you know, it's, it's a fascinating and, and, uh, and very difficult book to sort of understand where you put it. But again, the Hebrew Bible puts it in writings, the Ketuvim, the collection that also includes Job and Ecclesiastes and uh, uh, Psalms and Proverbs and the Song of Solomon. Whereas in our uh, Christian Bible, we see Lamentations and Daniel both as part of the prophetic writings. So we're going to study it that way. Week 5, then, we will get to the Minor Prophets, what the, the Hebrew Bible calls the Book of the Twelve. Uh, the Hebrew Bible and the Christian Old Testament are exactly the same content, but they have uh, radically different numbers of books in them, because the Hebrew Bible takes all twelve of the Minor Prophets and calls it one book. It's called the Book of the Twelve, but it's the same content as our twelve Minor Prophets in our Bible. Okay. Um, so we'll talk about the Book of the Twelve, the Minor Prophets, and then look at Hosea, Joel, and Amos. The week six, we'll continue to open this up, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, uh, Habakkuk, and Zephaniah. And then week seven, the post-exilic prophets. These are the prophets that wrote after the uh, Israelites, particularly the, the, the Jews of Judah, came back out of Babylon, out of exile, and returned to uh, many of them. You know, not, not as many as you might think, but many of them returned to Jerusalem. Those post-exilic prophets are Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. And then we'll finish the last, uh, the week eight, we'll have an hour lecture on the message of the prophets and then the final exam. Again, three quarters of the way through the class, I'll give you the notes to study for the final exam and it'll pretty much sum up everything you need to know for the class. So everybody should study it, even if you don't want to take the test. Any questions about any of that? 
Okay, um, last week we looked at this chart, and these are the four, what we call, the four uh, major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. Isaiah we looked at last week. Today we're going to talk about Jeremiah. Jeremiah prophesied to the Jews in Judah, particularly in Jerusalem, but in the whole southern kingdom of Judah, and to those Jews in captivity. The last, toward the last of his book, he's, he actually writes to the Jews that have already been taken off into captivity. Because the Babylonian captivity didn't happen all at one time. In 586, the Babylonians showed up outside, um, outside the city of Jerusalem and ended up conquering Jerusalem but not destroying it. They took some of the um, Israelites, I should say Judahites, they're all Israelites, but it, can, it gets confusing. The northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah, somebody should have made them name that northern kingdom something else, but they didn't. So the, the people of Judah, some of them were taken off into captivity at that time. That included, for instance, the prophet Ezekiel. Ezekiel was taken off in that first deportation. Well, because the various kings in Judah um, were fluctuating between whether or not they were obedient to their new masters in Babylon or not, the, the Babylonians had to come back a couple of times, and there ended up being three deportations. Um, and so when we talk about writing to the Jews in captivity after the first deportation, Jeremiah is still there. The city of Jerusalem had not been destroyed yet. Uh, the temple had not been destroyed, and so part of what Jer Jeremiah is doing is he's writing to those, those uh, Jews from Judah who had been taken off in the first deportation, the first Babylonian captivity, okay? Um, we'll talk about that a little bit more. And then it is about Judah, that is the southern kingdom of Judah and Jerusalem, and their problems, very serious problems, and a declaration of condemnation that is coming against them. And then also there's one section where he deals with the nations. There actually is um, one of the chapters, two of the chapters, I guess, go through and list condemnations for a number of other nations, including Egypt and Moab and Ammon and even Babylon. The time period <coughs> during which Jeremiah um, prophesied was from the king Josiah through Jehoahaz, Jehoiakim, Jehoiakim, and Zedekiah. Uh, there actually was another one in there that wasn't in there for very long. These are the kings that... Um, that reigned. Now, Jeremiah was a prophet for 52 years um, and probably started when he was quite young. Um, we don't know exactly when he died, as a matter of fact, because he was forced off into Egypt. We're going to talk about that when we actually go through some of the text. He and his, his aide and secretary, uh, Baruch, were taken, were forcibly taken to Egypt by people who were running away once again from Babylon, or from the Babylonians. And so he ended up, we know, prophesying against the idolatry of the people even in Egypt and died in Egypt, but we don't know exactly when. Um, the dates, 627 to 585, the, the time period covered, and the historical setting, 2 Kings 22 to 25. Virtually all of these prophetic writings fit in some specific historical context. Well, in, in, second, in the, the, the books of Kings, the book of Chronicles, books of Chronicles, first and second of each, um, they are histories. They're history books. And so the things that Jeremiah is, is writing about, that, that God gave him to speak as prophecy to the people of Judah, the historical events of that are recorded elsewhere in the Old Testament, in Second Kings. And so if you read both of those, you get both a historical narrative in Second Kings, as well as the perspective that Jeremiah has as God inspires him to that. So it's a, it's a fascinating kind of uh, crossover if you look at those together. Um, I want to give you, uh, before I get into even the history of Jeremiah, I want to talk about these kings a little bit, okay? Stepping back a little further than, um, than Jeremiah, you'll notice that Isaiah, the, one we, the man we talked about last week, prophesied under Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. Hezekiah was the king of the southern kingdom of Judah um, starting in the early 700s, about 715. We, we don't have an exact, but we think it was about 715. Hezekiah didn't always use the best judgment. He was the primary king that Isaiah was prophesying to that we talked about last week. Hezekiah didn't always have the best judgment, but he was trying. And so for that reason, he's considered a good king. When Hezekiah died, his son Manasseh, uh, Hezekiah ruled for 29 years, Manasseh, Hezekiah's son, came in. He ruled for 55 years, and he was the worst. 
He was like the worst king ever. Hezekiah had tried to inspire the people to worship God, even though, like I say, he didn't always have the best judgment about political matters and things like that. Manasseh is the one, more than any other king, that was responsible for leading the people of Judah into worshiping false gods and all sorts of horrible things. So he did not father, follow his father's footsteps. After Manasseh, the, his son Ammon ruled for just two years, and then Josiah comes in. Now, Josiah comes in, um, we're talking about 90 years from Hezekiah to Josiah. So about 90 years, almost 100 years in terms of the prophetic time between Isaiah and, um, and Jeremiah. Isaiah's focus was that Assyria was coming to judge and Isaiah was there when the northern kingdom of, it, of um, was assaulted and the southern kingdom, Hezekiah, was saved miraculously by God. You fast forward about 90 to 100 years, depending upon whose date you want to look at, and you have Josiah. Josiah, who was the, um, the grandson of Hezekiah. Josiah, one of the very best kings. He did the reform um, of, called the reform of Josiah, and around 640, he started about 640 BC, and he brought the people, tried to force the people back into worshiping God. He tore down altars of uh, foreign gods, etc. So Josiah was a good king. Josiah died, and his son Jehoahaz came in, but Jehoahaz only ruled for three months before the Egyptians, I'm going to talk about that in a second, Egyptians took him captive and took him off into Egypt as a prisoner, and he lived there the rest of his life. Then another of Josiah's sons, Jehoiakim, whose name you see right here, Jehoiakim comes in, and Jehoiakim is another bad king. He does not follow his father's direction. Um, he not only is a bad king in terms of leading the people into idolatry, but he's also a bad king because he rebels against Babylon, and the, who were the rulers at that time. And when he rebels, the Babylonians come back in, and they crush the rebellion. Um, Jehoiakim is murdered, and his son, Jehoiakim, comes in, and he only is in power three months before the Babylonians take him off into captivity as a punishment for what his father did. And, and you get this idea, Jehoiakim and then Zedekiah. Zedekiah is the king more than any other single one that Jeremiah is talking about. Now, I'll tell you all that because in this time period, there are, um, let me back up here and show you, we looked at this chart before, Isaiah prophesied to Judah, but during the time, about the same time that Hosea and Amos were prophesying to the northern kingdom of Israel, it was still around, and Assyria was dominant. Almost a hundred years later, Jeremiah comes along, and at that point, Babylon is just ascending and taking over, and he's prophesying to the southern kingdom of Judah about their idolatry and their sin. Um, and in the interim, during this period of time, you've got all of these kings. A couple of them, Hezekiah and Josiah, were good in terms of trying to worship the Lord. Some of them, Manasseh and others, were horrible. And politically, they kept, they wouldn't listen to the prophets. And, for instance, when Jeremiah comes along, he says that God is going to use uh, Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar, and the Babylonians to punish you, and if you don't want to be completely destroyed, then surrender. Well, they don't want to do that, and so they don't listen to it. And they continue to defy God, they continue to not listen to God's prophet, and everything that Jeremiah says came, came true. But various of these kings, as you go along, are... Um, you'll have one that sides with Babylon, and then the next one will side with Egypt, which were the two powers during the time of, of Jeremiah. And then they'll side with Babylon. And so you've got uh, Egypt coming in and taking off Jehoahaz, and then you've got Babylon coming in and taking off Jehoiakim, and back in, you know, all of this stuff going on. Part of the reason I'm telling you that is because this all happens in real history. This is real-time stuff. And all of the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel especially, well, the minor prophets as well, but in terms of the major prophets, they're dealing with very real political situations in the time period they live. I, most Christians, I think, read the Bible and they have no concept of where, the fact that this really happened. This is really historical. That there were other things going on when all this is happening. Jeremiah, of all the prophets, is probably more... Uh, connected to the historical events of his time than any other, even than Isaiah. Some of Isaiah's uh, writings are 
kind of historic neutral. You can read them at any time. Jeremiah, there's virtually very little, not virtually nothing, but very little in Jeremiah that isn't a direct commentary on what's happening historically at that time. Uh, you've got that chart in, uh, online. And these are two images that we have, historic, of, of, uh, which both, I think, give you the picture of Jeremiah. This is from the Sistine Chapel, painted by Michelangelo. And so you've got Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. This one is Rembrandt, uh, Jeremiah lamenting over the destruction of Jerusalem. And again, you get the sense that Jeremiah spent most of his life with his head in his hands, you know, <laughs> because that's the kind of life that he lived. And I think these, these kind of images give you a very strong sense of what it was like for him. He was the weeping prophet. He had a difficult life himself because of what God called him to do and the fact that nobody was on his side. Um, and he lived at a very difficult time in history, okay? Now... Let's talk about the message of Jeremiah. Like Isaiah before him, Jeremiah's concern uh, were the three points of um, all of the Old Testament prophets, for the most part. Now, some of the uh, Old Testament prophets, Jonah and a couple of others, the minor prophets, they had specific kind of things they're focusing on. But if you look at all of them together, they all, do, all deal with this. We talked about this under Isaiah, but it's worth looking at because this is the prophetic message. Three points in the prophetic message of the Old Testament. One, that you, either Israel or Judah, depending upon which prophet you're reading, you have broken the covenant with God and you had better repent. Second message, uh, point of the message is, if you don't repent, then there will be judgment. And that judgment will come not only on you, but on all nations. To a great extent, in the same way that God said he would bless all nations through Abraham, through Isaac, and through Jacob, through the eventual Davidic king that would come to take over uh, David's throne, in the same way all nations are to be uh, judged to a great extent because of the actions of the people of Israel, the Jewish people, whether they be the nation of Israel in the north or the nation of Judah in the south. Yet, for all of that judgment, there is hope beyond the judgment for a glorious restoration in the future of both Israel, Judah, and, in fact, for all the nations. It's interesting that in Isaiah and Jeremiah, for instance, we have, in both of them, litanies of condemnations, of, of statements against nations other than Israel and Judah. And those are very clear messages from God through his prophets that God is the God of all nations, not just the God of, of the Jewish people. And so he makes sure that those, those things get in there. So these are the three points that, that you got to remember, especially if you're going to take the test. <laughs> um, these were the points of the prophets of the Old Testament. You have broken the covenant. You better repent. If you don't repent, there will be judgment. But even in the midst of that judgment, there is a hope for future restoration. In fact, in Jeremiah, in Isaiah as well, but in Jeremiah, there's, there's judgment and condemnation, and then there's a glimmer of hope. And then judgment and condemnation and a glimmer of hope. God never leaves out the hope, and he consistently says, if you will repent, if you will return, then the judgment doesn't have to happen now. But even if it does happen now, because you don't repent long term, there will be a restoration. In fact, Jeremiah 31, the chapter of Jeremiah 31, is one of the great statements of hope in the whole, all of Scripture about the new covenant that God will establish, the new covenant that we know and believe was fulfilled in, in Jesus Christ. Um, and while those are the three statements of the prophetic message, in every case when the description is made, in Isaiah and in Jeremiah as well, over how is it that they've broken the covenant of God? What's wrong? What have you done? What are your particular failings? There are three of them. One, idolatry, following other gods. Jeremiah gets into very specific uh, details on that, including the child sacrifice, which was happening right outside the walls of Jerusalem. They were worshiping the gods Molech and Chemesh, both of whom required child sacrifice. In fact, the whole sort of traditional view of Hades as being fire and brimstone kind of thing, that image originally came from the valley of ben Hinnom, which is on the south and western side of the city of Jerusalem, because there was constantly sacrifice to foreign gods going on there, including the sacrifice of children. And this idea of this smoke and stench and fire that, that represents hell, or Hades, uh, in, throughout history, really comes initially, the first references, 
were the events of worshiping false gods in the Valley of Benhenna. Okay? Um, so in addition, idolatry, social injustice, not caring for those who cannot take care of themselves, particularly the widow, the orphan, the poor, and the foreigner. And then religious ritualism instead of true worship, thinking that you can, they could just get by with following the ritualistic patterns of, their, of the Jewish faith and not really worshiping God. In fact, uh, one of the things that might be helpful to notice is that in Jeremiah, as well as in Isaiah, they frequently will refer back to Deuteronomy as being when the covenant, the Mosaic covenant, was established. That was when Moses was given the law, when God established the covenant uh, of the Mosaic covenant. But that's not the only covenant God established. God had, previous to that, had established a covenant with Abraham, which basically summed up, was summed up in, uh, I will be your God and you will be my people. And so, follow me. There was no law under Abraham. There were no, you know, there was no quid pro quo. You do this and I'll do this. It was, I'll be your God and you'll be my people. Great. Then later, the promise to David that there would always be an heir of David uh, on the throne, uh, or that there would ultimately be an heir of David on the throne. There was no requirements with that either. The promise was given to David, and that's why Solomon was allowed to continue to be on the throne until his death, because Solomon, as David's son, was allowed to continue even after he set up the worshiping of foreign gods because of the promise that was made to David. Now, in Jeremiah, the point comes out that you folks, Jew, you people of Judah, the Jews of Judah, you're focusing entirely on the Mosaic Covenant, thinking that as long as you do all of the things in the law ritually, you sacrifice the animals, you bring offerings of oil and grain, you do the, you do the mechanical stuff, the, the mechanical part of the Mosaic Covenant, and you're okay. Completely forgetting the fact that all of the covenants, including especially the Abrahamic Covenant and the Davidic Covenant, did not have legalistic requirements. They were covenants of relationship. Jeremiah points out that when they think that they're going to be okay with God by just doing the ritual stuff that's in the Mosaic Covenant, they are, they are defying and even defiling the Abrahamic Covenant that came before and the Davidic Covenant that came after. There's more, and the point is, there's more even to the Mosaic Covenant than the ritual. There has to be a relationship. And in fact, when, in, in Jeremiah, when they talk about the people of Judah uh, breaking the covenant, the word that they use for breaking the covenant is not like breaking a law. It's not as though I broke a traffic law and got a ticket. It's a word that is closer to annulment. It is the breaking of a relationship, not of a legal requirement. And so in Jeremiah, they're talking about the fact that when the people of Judah, the Jewish people, when they broke the covenant with God, they were annulling their relationship. There's a sense of a personal um, devastation, if you will, that they are causing by denying their relationship with God. And that's a very important point. Again, just the ritual part of the Mosaic Law is not enough. You have to have the heart, the relationship, the covenant connection in relationship that is reflected truthfully in the Mosaic Covenant, but even more directly and cleanly in the Abrahamic Covenant and the Davidic Covenant. Does that make sense? Okay. Let me talk just a little bit about Jeremiah. I think this is, okay. Um, before I do that, let me talk about person Jeremiah. <clears throat> Jeremiah was son of a Kohen, is the Hebrew word. It means he was a Jewish priest, the son of Hilkiah. Um, they lived in the town of Anathoth, which was uh, the equivalent of about three miles from Jerusalem, which meant that the, um, when you talk about the, the priestly, that people, that means descended from uh, Levi. They were Levites. But there were too many Levites for all of them to be actively involved in temple worship. They sometimes had other responsibilities. And so the, the fact that they identify... Uh, Jeremiah as being the son of a man, a Jewish priest that did not live in Jerusalem, indicates that they were not part of the temple worship. Uh, they came from Anathoth. The uh, suggestion is that uh, in Jeremiah mentions his early life as being very happy. He was called by God very early, maybe as early as age 16, but probably in, in his teens anyway, before 20, to be a prophet of God. He protests in the initial uh, call, and we're talking about that, uh, that he's just a child. You know, why, why, why do I have to do this? I'm just a kid. 
And he deals with that in the first chapter of Jeremiah, in the very first chapter. Isaiah waits until the sixth chapter of his book to talk about how he got his call. Jeremiah leads with that. And he's a very young man. He prophes uh, We think about 626 B.C. was in, when he received his call. And again, he ended up being a prophet for 52 years until 574 B.C. Um, the... I talked about the kings already, the time period in which he lived. Um, Jeremiah was, oh, how do I want to go about this? Um, the first 20 years of Jeremiah's prophetic life, he didn't write anything down. The first 20 years, he was not a literary prophet, in other words. You remember we talked before about the fact that there are non-literary prophets that came earlier. Prophets like Elijah and Elisha, major prophets, but they didn't write anything down. For the first 20 years of Jeremiah's prophetic responsibilities, he too did not write anything down. And then God called him to compile this book, to write down all the things that he had for him to say. They, he wrote it down, or actually had it written down. His secretary, Baruch, uh, wrote, wrote it for him. And then the king, uh, one of the, the, the bad kings... I don't want to keep mentioning these names because it'll just confuse you more. Um, when he received the scroll, he ended up cutting it up in pieces and burning it. Well, Jeremiah and Baruch went back, and this was inspired by God. It's not something that, that they had to struggle with, and so they wrote it again. In fact, they added more to it as God inspired them. And so that comes down to us, we believe, as the book of uh, uh, Jeremiah that we have today. Now, the book of Jeremiah is... It's a complicated book in terms of any sort of scholarly study. The, the, the theme is very clear. We know what this book is about. It is, as I said, the three major points. The nation of Judah has, has broken the covenant with God. They have to repent. If they won't, they'll be judged, but there's future hope. That's very clear. But the actual book itself, how many of you completed the reading of Jeremiah? Did it flow for you, or did you feel no. like, you know, it head fake? Very repetitious. Well, it's repetitious. It also doesn't go in order. You're reading along, and then you realize, well, well, we're in chapter 22, and you're talking about something you talked about in chapter 4. That's right. Because Jeremiah is not chronological. There's only one short section toward the end in Jeremiah that's actually chronological, where he's dealing with the actual fall of Jerusalem. But um, apparently, he, Jeremiah and Baruch we believe by God's inspiration, organized this book according to themes. So when he's talking about a particular kind of violation of the covenant of God, whether it happened under at the end of Josiah's reign, or if it happened under Je Je uh, Jehoiakim's reign, or whether it happened under Zedekiah's reign, these things are 50 years apart, he puts them all together. There are places where he even uses thematic words, the word shuv, which means to turn away from or to turn back from. Uh, it's a Hebrew word. It's the same word as metanoia in Greek, which means to repent, literally to turn around. Okay? There are places where he's focusing on shuv as, a, as an idea, as a, a motif, if you will. And so he addresses all kinds of different events throughout the history of all of these five kings um, that related to them either turning away from God, to shuv away from God, or turning back to God, or needing to turn back to God. And so the organization of this book is very hard to outline in terms of any sort of sequential thing. I just need to know that right up front here. Um, it's because it's broken up differently than chronological, it also is kind of an anthology. There are poetic parts of it, poetic oracles in here. There are various kinds of, po of uh, prophetic proclamations. There's some narratives telling history. As I say, the part, one part of it that's chronological is when he's actually describing the fall of Jerusalem. That is a chronological order. There's other dialogues where there's back and forth between people. And so it's a very complicated book to try to sort through. I'm going to give you an outline here in a minute. But even that outline, it, it, it doesn't follow in sequence the way we're typically used to, used to experiencing it. Another reason why this book is complicated is that we have very different... Um, very different books of Jeremiah depending upon which source you look at. Now, historically, before the, the mid-20th century, mid-20th century between 1947 and the mid-50s, that's when they discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls, okay? 
Um, the Dead Sea Scrolls gave us a lot, ended up being the oldest extant versions of, of the Old Testament books that we have. The, the Scroll of Isaiah, for instance, is the most complete, the oldest version we have. The same thing is true with Jeremiah. Prior to the Dead Sea Scrolls, the book of Jeremiah, we had um, two versions, if you will, of the book of Jeremiah. There was the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of very old Hebrew writings, which was done uh, around 200, 150 to 200 BC. So this is 150, 200 years before Jesus. We have the Greek translation of the Hebrew text into Greek. Then we have the Masoretic texts. The Masoretic texts were actually a bunch of Jewish scholars got together in order to try to come up with the definitive Jewish Bible. And the Masoretic texts, uh, they worked on them for a couple hundred years, were really established in 900 AD. So that's a, you know, that's a thousand years after the Septuagint. Most people had thought the Masoretic text is the most accurate. And so when we have our English translations, they use the best scholarship they can. They use the Masoretic text, they took some things from the Septuagint, they made critical judgments about what's in there. Well, the problem is the Septuagint and the Masoretic text are about 20% different. The uh, Septuagint is, one, is about one-eighth shorter <laughs> than the Masoretic text. There are just passages, sections, that aren't in the Masoretic text, or the, the Septuagint, that are in the Masoretic text. Which is one reason they traditionally have said the Masoretic text is a better, is a better version of Jeremiah. Well, the Dead Sea Scrolls come along in the middle 20th century, and they actually agree more with the Septuagint. <clears throat> which means scholarship, scholars since then, the last 60 years, have been going through trying to say, okay, we got the Septuagint, we got the Masoretic text, we got the Dead Sea Scrolls, which is the oldest versions we have. They have to try to decide what are the differences. What might have gotten left out of the Septuagint but needs to be included because it's in the Masoretic text? What might have been added to the Masoretic text that didn't, that shouldn't have been, you know, somebody added it because it's not in the Septuagint? There is, Jeremiah is of all the books in the Old Testament, all the books in the Bible, therefore, because the New Testament is much more secure, um, the one that we have the most questions about in terms of the reliability of the text. Is it the Septuagint more accurate? Is the Masoretic text more accurate? The Dead Sea Scrolls, are they the most definitive? I tell you that because you need to know that in case anybody ever challenges you with the reliability of the Bible. The point that you need to remember is, even though there is as much as a 20% difference in terms of the text, there is no theological difference. In other words, the differences between them don't have any content that fundamentally alters the message of Jeremiah. So even though there's that difference, it's a purely academic one, because it doesn't have any effect on the content of the book or what it's telling us. Does that make sense? But again, part of our task here is when we look at these books, we have to know something about um, what our knowledge is from a textual critical kind of point of view. Now, um, any questions about any of that? So we choose it. We don't know. Nobody knows. That's the point. And so scholars today, when they put together an English translation, for instance, they have to take the Septuagint, which is older. They take the Masoretic text, with the Jew which the Jewish scholars in the first millennium thought was the most accurate. And then they take the Dead Sea Scrolls, and they have to decide what we believe is the most accurate representation of what really would have been. And there are a lot of other sort of scholarly clues. Um, sometimes there are glosses. Glosses mean they, they add ex ex explanations. Like the example I always use for that, you guys know what the Parallel Bible is? Or the... the uh, Amplified Bible is? Okay, the Amplified Bible, if you've ever seen one, is they take every verse and in order to try to explain it as best they can, they take, you know, a 10-word verse and turn it into 30 words. You know, it's a great big fat Bible because they, they've tried to give all this explanation so that it's not confusing. Well, in doing so, they come up with something I don't think is very valid. You know, it's, it's too much and it's somebody's opinion. Well, those additional words to try to explain it are called glosses. And so they have to try to decide what appears, and they've got, they've got ways to help figure that out, what appear to be glosses in the Masoretic text that don't agree, that aren't in the Septuagint, don't agree with uh, the, the Dead Sea Scrolls, or what's missing from the uh, Septuagint that's in the Dead Sea Scrolls that, you know, that we think should be retained. It's, a com it's not easy. That's why people spend their whole lives learning how to do this. But that's why they put, they put notes and this is the Masoretic text. Exactly. 
If you've got a good translation of the Bible, which you should have certainly, especially a good study Bible, if there's ever an alternate reading of something, you'll see a footnote that says, you know, um, two of the most ancient texts include the word blah, 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 here, okay? And so they'll give you those variant readings, but you need to know that nothing about the content of Jeremiah theologically is in question, but there is some, some question about which words go in there, because we have different sources. And that's probably more true of Jeremiah than any other single book in the Bible, okay? Uh, the message of Jeremiah, again written, we believe the book was written about 585. <coughs> Now that's later than um, Jeremiah, the start of Jeremiah's ministry, um, because, as I told you, the first 20 years of his prophetic ministry, they didn't write anything down. He wasn't told to write anything down, and finally God said, I want you to write this down. Um, the theme and purpose of the book is judgment against Judah and Jerusalem. That's the whole focus. You broke those three points. You've broken the covenant. And you need to repent. If you don't repent, there will be judgment. And even in the midst of that judgment, there will be uh, hope for the future. The book identifies in some specific content the sins, particularly uh, the sins of idolatry and covenant breaking by the people of the kingdom of Judah, and the coming judgment at the hands of the Babylonian Empire. So this is a book of judgment against the people of Judah, as well as a promise of future hope. I believe, and others might disagree, but I believe the, most, the key chapter here is chapter 31 which, in the, uh, amidst all the declarations given by God through Jeremiah, of coming judgment and condemnation and destruction at the hands of the Babylonian. Chapter 31 promises a time of renewal when Yahweh will make a new covenant and that he will write that covenant not on tablets of stone, but on people's hearts. The key, oh, well, I threw these maps in here. This is the Assyrian Empire. We've looked at this map before. This was the empire when... Um, Isaiah was prophesying. The Assyrian Empire was, was taken over by the Babylonian Empire, and the, the Assyrian Empire, the capital was here in Nineveh. The Babylonian Empire, the capital was Babylon. And you'll see it went all the way over to Asia Minor, uh, Egypt, uh, the northern third of the Arabian Peninsula, all of that. And that's, this was the situation when Je uh, Jeremiah was prophesying. Now, key verses. I've got three key ver three verses that I think sort of summarize the key points in Jeremiah. Jeremiah 7, God says, For when I brought your ancestors, speaking to the Jews of Judah, when I brought your ancestors out of Egypt and spoke to them, I did not give them commands about burnt offerings and sacrifices. This is where God's saying, That's, this isn't the point. All right? But I gave them this command, Obey me and I will be your God and you will be my people. That was the covenant of Abraham before that. Walk in obedience to all I command you, that it may go well with you. But they did not listen or pay attention. Instead, they followed the stubborn inclinations of their evil hearts. They went backward and not forward. This is that emphasis that it's not sacrifice, it's not following the ritual law, but rather relationship is important. Second verse from Jeremiah 8, peace, peace, they say, when there is no peace. We'll mention the fact that there were false prophets in the kingdom of Judah, who in order to look good to the king and everybody else, would claim, oh, no, 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 Babylonians are coming, Babylonians are coming, Babylonians aren't going to be here. Oh, well, if, if the Babylonians come, then they'll be defeated. Oh, well, it looks like they're winning, but they'll only win for two years, and then we'll be back. This is what the false prophets are saying. Peace, peace. So God says through Jeremiah, peace, peace, they say when there is no peace. Are they ashamed of their detestable conduct? No, they have no shame at all. They do not even know how to blush. So they will fall among the fallen. They will be brought down when they are punished, says the Lord. The prophecy was that because of lying and falsely testifying as to what the Lord is saying, that the false prophets would be amongst those who suffered most when, when the Jerusalem fell. And from Jeremiah 31, I've already said I think it's the most important chapter. In fact, it's a beautiful chapter. You need to go home and read it like ten times. Uh, starting with the 31st verse. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant... With the people of Israel and with the people of Judah, I will not, and notice here, the people of Israel, that is the northern kingdom, and the people of Judah. By the time this was stated, the northern kingdom had been destroyed by Assyria, like 140 years earlier. And yet, the promise of God is that this is for all the Jewish people, even the ones from the north that are gone. I mean, the northern kingdom of Israel does not exist anymore, and the people are gone. 
But God says, this is for them too. I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time. Now, in this case, he's using Israel, meaning the whole country. The people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord, I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. That is the, the anchor statement of God's covenant with his people, both his people Israel and his people us. Okay. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord, because they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. The new covenant, written on the heart. This is the covenant that Jesus instituted when he came to earth, and which will be ultimately fulfilled at the second coming. So, so that was messianic. Absolutely messianic. A lot of the hope passages, the restoration passages of Isaiah and Jeremiah, Ezekiel and Daniel are messianic. And they're in, now, and they, many of them, in Jeremiah, for instance, specifically refer to the, the throne of David, the one who will fulfill and sit on the throne of David. That's, those are messianic statements. Okay. Hebrews 10, 16 verifies that. Yeah. What does it say? Uh, and, and the Holy Spirit also testifies to us, for after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with him after those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws upon their heart and on their mind, and I will write them. And he says, in their sins and their lost deeds, I will remember no more. So Hebrews quotes this as being an affirmation that this was a prophetic statement about the coming of the Messiah. Okay? All right. Let's talk about the particular message. We're going to walk through. Any questions about any of that? We want to walk through Jeremiah, give you a sense of um, you know, what's in here, uh, how it all fits together. The first chapter of Jeremiah is the call to Jeremiah. And as I say, Isaiah didn't focus as heavily on the call. He started out uh, talking about what's going on with God, and doesn't, Isaiah doesn't mention his call until chapter 6. Jeremiah 1, first thing, Jeremiah tells us how he got called by God. It's, he identifies a number of points. First, that it is Yahweh God, the one true God who has called him. Secondly, Yahweh tells him that he had chosen him, Jeremiah, for this task before Jeremiah was even born. God had planned to use him in this way. Third, he talks about the fact that the call centers on proclaiming the word of Yahweh, not something else. It's going to, his job, Jeremiah's job, is to speak the word of God. That's what a prophet is, one who speaks the word of God. But he affirms that. Fourth, he says that Yahweh will empower the young Jeremiah to speak his word. Again, Jeremiah starts out saying, Wow, why me? I'm just a kid. As we say, he may have been as young as 16, but almost certainly less than 20 when he first got this call. Um, and Suzanne asked me earlier that we, you know, we have examples of prophets. M Moses, for instance, who was the first and foremost of the prophets, and now Jeremiah, who weren't keen on this call. You know, they weren't, they, they were, they, they were let the call go to the answering machine if they had a choice. So God, God spoke to them and said, you have to do this. As we go along with the prophets, we'll be identifying those. That was not true with Isaiah. You know, Isaiah was said, here am I, send me. Well, if Jeremiah could have run for it, I think he probably would have. And if he'd known what was coming in more detail, he definitely would have. So, but here it is, a call of God from before he was born. And Yahweh says, I will empower you. And he says... In his call, um, it's going to be hard. They are going to fight against you, but they will not be able to destroy you. You know, uh, Oppose you they will, but destroy you they will not. I read that and I, it almost sounds like Yoda. <laughs> they will, but no. Anyway, um, this idea that they're all going to be against you. You better get ready for it. It's coming. Um, and again, as a young man, this must have been very hard for him to hear. Then um, he promises the opposition, he promises even persecution, but that his power will be with him. I am with you, he says to Jeremiah. Now, um, he gives, the, the indication to Jeremiah at this point is affirmed, his call is affirmed, in the giving of two visions. The first of those visions is a vision of an almond tree. An almond tree in Hebrew is the shakeh. And he says, you know, 
he gives a vision and says, what do you see, uh, Jeremiah? He says, I see a shaken, I see an almond tree. And God says to him, in the same way, I will be shoked, which means watching, over you and over the situation. There's a play on words, shaked, shoked, between almond tree and I am watching. That's the first vision that he gives as an affirmation of the fact he is going to be there taking care of things. The second vision he gives him is of a boiling pot that is tilted away from the north and ready to spill over. And that, God tells Jeremiah, is a reference to the fact that a power from the north, Babylon, the Babylonians, will be spilling out as a, from a boiling cauldron over the land. And that that Babylonian invasion which is coming will be the way in which God will bring judgment upon the nation of Judah. Okay? So those two visions are the affirmation that God gives to, to Jeremiah that you're my guy. It's not going to be easy. In fact, I promise you it's going to be very, very hard, but I'm with you. And I've been planning this for you since before the time you were born. And so Jeremiah accepts the call. Not like, not like he has a whole lot of choice, I think. Um, the second chapter, or the second section, I guess I should say, is when there, uh, Jeremiah then describes Judah's sin. It starts out in the second chapter with a declaration of uh, Judah's idolatry, and he describes it in the form of a broken marriage. I told you three times, God says through Jeremiah that the people have forsaken him, and he introduces what becomes a common prophetic motif, and that is that Israel or Judah, the Jewish people, have been an unfaithful, adulterous wife, compared to Yahweh, who is presented as a wronged husband who has been faithful. And so this broken relationship, the idea that the, the people of, of Israel and Judah have been adulterous against God in the same way that an adulterous wife sleeps with other men. That whole, as I say, that, that becomes a common prophetic theme. You get to the book of Hosea, for instance, and that is the whole theme of Hosea, so much so that God orders Hosea to marry a woman named Gomer, who is a prostitute. And when he marries Gomer, she continues to run off, and he continues to go after her. In fact, he has to end up buying her back. Apparently, she'd gotten into such trouble, you know, uh, she was being owned by somebody else. And so this theme of the unfaithful uh, followers of God, the Jewish people, being an unfaithful wife. Um, now, and he talks about the fact that that's true, both in terms of their relationship with foreign gods, and also in terms of the fact that they have not fulfilled their obligations to social justice. Um, and this is the first place, very early on here, where they talk about the, the breaking of the relationship, the breaking of the covenant relationship, which they symbolize as being a broken marriage. It's not like breaking a law or breaking a rule. Uh, the word they use is not a violation of a law, but rather an annulment of a relationship. So the emphasis is a personal relationship has been broken. Not just that a rule has been violated. Okay? Um, and that continues throughout the entire book. God even is puzzled in the second chapter about how is it that I, have been, I was so good to you and I brought you up out of Egypt. I redeemed you. I cared for you. I was your God. And yet you treat me like this. And there's a, there's a very sort of uh, personal kind of feeling. And, and, and God expresses his outrage in a number of ways. At one point he describes the people of Judah as being like a female donkey in heat who cannot control herself, um, you know, running after other gods. In the, the third chapter of Jeremiah, again sticking with this theme of Judah's sin, the indictment, we have God, Yahweh God, continually throughout this calling his people back to him and saying if they will return to him, then they will, he will be able to set aside the judgment that's coming. They describe Israel, the northern kingdom of Israel, as having been like a hardened prostitute who was, again, there was never a good king in Israel. They were always going the wrong direction since the time the north and the south split in two. And so the northern kingdom of Israel is described as a hardened prostitute who no longer even feels any shame. The southern kingdom of Judah is then described as her sister who should have learned her lesson from having watched her older sister, the way she acted and what she became, but instead the younger sister also is falling into sin. Um, and so there's this two sisters kind of analogy that is used there. There's then, a again throughout all of this, 
there is then a glimpse of future restoration. And even if you keep on this path, I will not, uh, not forever forsake you. That um, he talks about the fact that the covenant as it used to exist, in fact, he talks about the Ark of the Covenant, which held the Ten Commandments, was the symbol of God's presence and amongst his people, that the Ark of the Covenant would be gone and would not be missed anymore because eventually he would restore in such a way that it would not be needed. So this idea of the covenant, which is not written on tablets of stone, but written on the heart, he's giving you sort of a, a precursor, a, a early reference to that, which he then speaks to more detail in uh, the 31st chapter. And then in Isaiah 4, we start getting this more details about the inevitable and terrible judgment that God is going to bring on them. He, um, he says because of the nation's serious sin that a horrific judgment is coming against them and it will be an invasion by the army of Babylon. That it will come rapidly because the Babylonians will arrive on swift horses and chariots they will come from the north and move south across Israel and across Judah to Jerusalem. And in, the, in that process, they talk about the fact from Dan in the far north to Ephraim in the middle. Ephraim was the largest of the ten northern tribes of, Is, of the nation of Israel. And so whenever you read references to Ephraim, it's kind of a shorthand to the northern kingdom, kingdom of Israel. And they refer to the northern kingdom of Israel as Ephraim several times in, in uh, Jeremiah. So... Jeremiah then is challenged by God, Yahweh, to find just one person in all of Jerusalem who is truthfully seeking him and the truth. This, this echoes the uh, conversation that Abraham had with God about the city of Sodom. Remember before life goes into Sodom, God was going to destroy Sodom and Abraham said, well, if we could find just you know, 40 people there who were righteous, would you not save the city? And through this fascinating conversation, Abraham talks God down from 40 to 30 to 20 to 10 and finally says, if you can find 10 righteous people in this whole city, I will save the city of Sodom. Well, now Yahweh tells Jeremiah, if you can find just one person in all of the city of Jerusalem who is truly seeking the truth, then I will not destroy Jerusalem. The point is, there are none. There is nobody within the city of Jerusalem at that point that, that Jeremiah can identify to prevent the destruction of Jerusalem. And so um, Jeremiah searches. He searches among the poor, among the leaders. He looks for somebody that he can identify to save Jerusalem, and he comes up empty-handed. Not one righteous person can he find in Jerusalem. Um, serious indictment. But at that point, God said, even though you couldn't find anybody, I will not allow everyone to be destroyed. And this is where we find introduced, and it's elsewhere in the Old Testament as well, the concept of the remnant. There is a whole remnant theology of the Old Testament. And it carries through, I think, all of church history, including the, the New Testament uh, church and down to our modern times. The idea of a remnant is that there always, no matter how many people turn away from God, he will not allow everyone to turn from him so that everyone deserves destruction, but there always will be at least a small contingent of people, a remnant, who remain faithful to him, and that he will use then as the seed from which he can regrow his people. So remnant theology occurs here in Jeremiah, but it's a constant theme that works throughout all of the Old Testament. That's uh, a, excuse me, that's, a, that's really profound. You said he will not allow. Correct. That's powerful. Yeah, and um, Particularly those, who, yeah, particularly those of us who are Calvinists, that's very consistent We know with our doctrines that uh, those who, who are in Christ, those who are saved, that God, it's because God has selected us, he's elected us, and God will never let all of the people turn away from him. He will always maintain a seed, a remnant of his people from which the church, or in this case the nation of Israel, could be regrown. Okay? Um, <coughs> now, uh, there are several other concepts that get introduced at this point, uh, including the idea that uh, the, the figurative use of sickness as a sign of their breaking of the covenant and of healing as the, a model of repentance and restoration. And this idea of sickness and of healing gets restated throughout Jeremiah, in fact, throughout all the prophetic literature, as symbols of, of denying or, or pulling away from God and then being restored to relationship with Him. Okay? Um, 
at this time, we identify the fact that this sort of forgiveness and restoration sort of thing is um, applies even to, well, to the entire nation of Israel. And one of the problems they had is that a lot of the theological leaders, you know, Jeremiah is just, God's just said, find even one righteous person, one who's seeking the truth, and Jeremiah couldn't do it. And so, at this point, uh, in chapter 6, they're identifying the fact that many of the theological leaders of Judah, that would be the court prophets and the priests, all of them start lining up. As Jeremiah starts speaking God's word, here's where they start lining up against Jeremiah. They start saying, Jeremiah, you're wrong. And in fact, they start saying, the people aren't really sinning. Oh, it's okay if they sacrifice a child to Baal every once in a while, as long as they still come to the temple and, you know, and bring their sacrifices. The religious leaders are defending the way people are acting. They are saying that Jeremiah is wrong. And then this is when they start with false prophesying, predicting peace, that everything will be fine, the Babylonians won't come. And then later when the Babylonians show up, oh, the Babylonians won't stay. And then they start crowing about it because after the Babylonians surround Jerusalem, the Egyptian army shows up on the horizon and the Babylonians leave Jerusalem to go deal with the Egyptians. And so all of the false prophets are saying, Neener, 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 Jeremiah, we told you that they weren't going to conquer Jerusalem. Well, as soon as Nebuchadnezzar chases the Egyptians off in short order, he's right back there at the, at the walls of Jerusalem again. Okay. Um, so this, these themes are coming up here. Then we get into um, the chapter 7, the, I, the emphasis on the fact that simple ritual practices are not sufficient. And in fact, God says, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to see, I, don't want to, I won't receive your sacrifices. I won't hear your prayers. Um, in fact, he says, look at Shiloh. Shiloh was a city that, uh, where the Ark of the Covenant had been kept for a while before David brought it to Jerusalem. It was a center for worship. It had been completely destroyed. There was nothing there but rubble. And God says, you see Shiloh? That's what's going to happen to Jerusalem. Just because the covenant was the, the Ark of the Covenant was there, just because they worship there, does not mean it's going to stick around. That same thing is going to happen to you. It's going to be horrific. It's going to be a tremendous destruction because of the sins of worshiping Molech and other false gods. Um, I think what we want to do right now is take a break. We then get to the next section in which Jeremiah. We get more of a description of Jeremiah's own problems, the way in which he struggles against the people um, that are opposing him, and also struggles against God. There are several places in here where Jeremiah's frustration over his own, um, his own persecution, he you know, is saying to God, how long is it going to take you to figure this out, God? Straighten this out. At one point, he actually gets kind of really mouthy, and God has to kind of put him in his place. Um, initially, for instance, um, the first part of Jeremiah 11 uh, describes how it is that the Israelites or the, the people of Judah have broken the covenant of Moses. And particularly, again, this is where they come back to the point that it's not just violating a rule, but rather it is an annulment, a breaking of a relationship. And because of that, Yah um, Jeremiah says, well, let me intercede for them, Yahweh. And Yahweh says, absolutely not. It's gone too far. They have done too much. He orders Jeremiah not to intercede for them. Later on, by the way, uh, when he gives that command again to, to Jeremiah not to intercede for the people of Judah, he says, if Moses and Samuel themselves, two of the great prophets, if Moses and Samuel themselves were standing in front of me interceding for Judah, I would not listen to them either. Um, and so it's a very, very serious kind of thing. Um, God says he will no longer listen to the cries. Now, again, several times God says, if they, I'll give you another chance if you repent right now. But after doing that earlier on, he says here, he will not allow them to, to return to him. He will not listen to their cries. At this point, and here's where we get into some of the conflicts that Jeremiah has, in the 11th chapter, uh, men from Anathoth, which is Jeremiah's hometown, men from Anathoth show up and plan to kill him. They're going to, to try to kill Jeremiah because of his testimony um, against the religious activities, against everything that's going on in Judah. Um, Jeremiah implores Yahweh to protect him. In fact, what he says is, get on with it. Literally, Yahweh, get on with it. Um, take care of things. Administer justice. Deal with these evil men right now. And Yahweh at this point gives him only a mild rebuke. And he says, you know, I am in charge here, Jeremiah. Um, you need to just 
Get on with what I've told you to do. Start, you know, continue to talk about the things I tell you to talk about, and I will make sure you're taken care of. They will not kill you. Don't worry about that. Um, in Jeremiah 13, we have this story of the linen belt. God describes the way, his, uh, describes Judah as a linen belt. And he tells Jeremiah, go and buy a linen belt. Linen would have been very delicate to buy a white linen belt. And he tells him to wear it. And after a short time, he says, okay, I want you to take it off and I want you to bury it under a bunch of rocks. Jeremiah does what he's told. A little while later, God says, okay, now go back and get it. And he gets it, and he always says to Jeremiah, what's it look like? He goes, well, it's ruin. You know, it's a terrible shame. And Yahweh says, in the same way, I will ruin the pride of Judah and the great pride of Jerusalem. This is one of the, quite a few of the sort of visual examples that we have. Um, there's also the wearing of a yoke later and things like that. So there's various ways in which Yahweh is giving symbols to and through Jeremiah for how he will, how he will respond to the sins of the people. Um, God then says that in response to the sin, he will cause a terrible drought to come. And again, he orders Yahweh, uh, Jeremiah not to pray for the well-being of the people. Even though it traditionally was an expectation that one of the responsibilities of a prophet was to intercede for the people, to pray for them. Um, and this is what Jeremiah assumes he's supposed to be doing when these things happen, like a drought occurs. And God says, no, do not pray for these people. Do not intercede for them. Um, and in fact, he says, one of the reasons you are not to intercede is because they continue to listen to false prophets who prophesy false visions, divinations, idolatries, and delusions from their own mind. I'm quoting here. And for that reason, because they, they are following in that way, those prophets who prophesy that um, no sword or famine will touch this land, that themselves will perish by sword and famine. And so God says to Jeremiah, do not intercede. Do not pray that this drought and the resulting famine would go away. This is part of the judgment against these prophets and the people who listen to them. Um, and this is, that's where he says, even if Moses and Samuel themselves were in front of me, I wouldn't be listening to them either. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, some of the other ways in which Jeremiah has to suffer because of his call. Boy, did you have a question? I did. Uh, what happens if we fast forward that to today and we pray for someone... In the same way, um, for our circumstances, for someone else. Well, the fact that it was ex usually expected that prophets and priests, people of God, would pray as intercessors for the people, that's the reason that you know, this case is unusual. This okay. case is particular. That's why God makes a point several times in Jeremiah to say, no, 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 I don't want you to do what ordinarily a prophet or a priest or a minister or even just another person of God would do. I don't want you interceding for these people. But the reason why that, they make such a point of that is because in ordinary cases, we are to intercede, including for those who have done evil, and interceding for those who, you know, that, that God's will will be done, but that they would recognize, you know, their failings and turn from them and therefore be blessed. So that just doesn't apply. That particular case does not apply to how we're supposed to act today, however, which is why it's such a strong point. However, that's not time sensitive. Wouldn't there be times... Well, if we got, if you got a special strange, message from God. Yeah, very strange yeah. times when, when, when we might be compelled to not intercede for someone. I think there are exceptional times when that might be the case. You know, God says, you know, I don't want you to intercede. I, I can think of two examples, historically. Um, John Wimber, who was the, the founder of uh, the Vineyard Fellowship. Uh, I had a class with, with, um, with him at Fuller. And David Watson had been a guy I'd worked with, and who was a, an Anglican minister, an evangelical Anglican from uh, England, who had cancer. John Wimber was friends of his, and John Wimber told us in class, when he went into, um, into David's hospital room, he, the first thing he prayed, which is always a smart thing to pray, is, how do you want me to pray? And he said, I had a very clear sense that God did want, not want me to pray for healing because God was not going to heal him, that God desired for him to come home. Um, that was a case where... John felt very clearly, I was not called to intercede for him to be made well, to heal, to be healed, because that's not what God's will was. So there's a case where he didn't intercede uh, to ask for healing because God said, no, that's not my, my will. Um, another case, when you talk about intercession for people who've done evil, uh, one of my heroes, G.K. Chesterton, was well known for, for debating people who were against the Christian faith. And, and Chesterton almost always won. He was a genius. 
Uh, the one person, as far as I know, the only person, and I've studied his life pretty well, the only person he ever refused to debate was Aleister Crowley. Aleister Crowley was the founder of the Church of Satan who called himself the most evil man alive. Well, Chesterton believed that in debating people, even people who disagreed with Christian faith or whatever, he always made a point of finding something good about them. And he always, he literally lived the pattern, if you can't say something good about somebody, don't say anything at all. And so he would identify something about them that was positive and noble at the same time he was disagreeing with their ideas. Crowley was somebody that Chesterton couldn't find anything good to say about. There literally was nothing good about that man in terms of any, any, any perception we could have. I mean, he, he relished being evil. And so Chesterton refused to debate him. And I think it was because, I, this is my own assessment, it's because there was nothing good he could say about him. In effect, that's sort of a parallel to not interceding for somebody, you know, not standing up and speaking to them, the truth to them, because this was not somebody that God wanted him to intercede for, interact with, kind of thing. So, anyway. But that would have to be a direct, I believe, a direct indication from God not to do it. Not the assumption that, well, I don't like that person, or that's an evil person, so I'm not going to pray for him. Okay. All right. Now, uh, again, Jeremiah complains to God about all the oppression that he's getting, all the difficulty, etc. And in fact, he goes too far and he actually accuses Yahweh perhaps of even deceiving him. You know, you didn't make it clear to me how bad this was going to get. And Yahweh sort of steps on him a little bit. He's very stern. He says, okay, Jeremiah, if you repent, I will restore you so that you may serve me. If you utter worthy, not worthless words, you will be my spokesman. In other words, even Jeremiah started off the track, and God had to straighten him out. Well, Jeremiah accepted the rebuke, and he straightened out, and he realized that God had not misled him. But there's uh, Jeremiah, almost more than any of the prophets, you get a picture of Jeremiah. You get a sense of who he was, of what struggles he went through, and even of his own failings. That he, you know, he began to question whether God was being straight up with him. And when God straightened him out and he realized he'd been wrong, Jeremiah has Baruch record that in this book. So that we read about Jeremiah's struggles. Uh, it's very honest in that regard. Okay? Um, we then have a number of other images. The, one of the strong images that we have in uh, the 18th chapter is a lesson from the potter's house. When Jeremiah is communicating with the people about what's wrong with them and what they have to do to change, God tells Jeremiah to go to a potter who has, you know, a potter with a wheel who's making bolts and, and whatnot. And at one point, um, while Jeremiah is there, a bowl gets out of alignment. If you've ever used a potter's wheel to get around it, if a bowl gets off center, then it gets all, you know, crooked and everything else. Well, when that happened, when it got crooked, the potter took the lump of clay pushed it all down together into nothing again, and remade a bowl that was straight. Well, that, that image of the potter who basically takes the, the out of shape or the malformed uh, pot and starts all over again to create something new from it, that's an image of what God will do with the Jewish people for having left him. He will start all over again. Um, there's a second pottery symbol that's used where God tells Jeremiah to take a pot that's already been dried so that it's no longer malleable, to take that pot and go to the Valley of Hinnom where they're sacrificing to other gods and in the sight of everybody to say, this is what the great God Yahweh will do to you because of this. And he smashes this pot in front of everybody as a sign of the fact that the people will be smashed in a way that they will not be returned. And so this, this symbolism that, that goes on. Um, and we, we do have instances where Jeremiah kind of despairs. He loses his, you know, his energy, and God has to re rejuvenate him and restore him. We then go on to the next big section, uh, where Jeremiah begins to challenge more directly the rulers, both the, uh, the king and also the nobility and the religious rulers in the, um, the prophets and the priests. We've talked about before, I think, in this class, uh, that the prophets in the olden days, their first responsibility was to preach, in most cases, to preach to the kings, because the kings were the ones that led the religious direction of the people. Good kings, like Josiah and Hezekiah to a great extent, led the people in the right direction, and so their worship was made right. Bad kings, like Manasseh and, and, um, and some of the, his descendants, 
we're responsible for taking the people in the wrong direction. So quite often the responsibility of the prophet was more to speak to the kings than it was to speak to the people. Now Jeremiah started kind of preaching to the people, at least publicly. At one point when he got arrested, he's in the courtyard of the, of the temple guards and he's preaching in public so everybody can hear it. But in this section we particularly are told that Jeremiah gets called to preach to the rulers and the prophets. He begins rebuking, rebuking the rulers and government. Uh, he specifically is, is addressing the king and gives a message to the king that um, he is responsible for drawing the people away and that as a result the entire city will die by sword, famine, and plague. But whoever is willing to go out and surrender to the Babylonians who would besiege them, then they would live. And you've still got all these priests saying, oh, Babylon's not going to bother us. The Babylonians won't be here. Don't worry about it. Um, then you end up with Jeremiah rebu rebuking the prophets and the audiences of the prophets. That is, the people who've been listening to them and, and following in their direction. And he says the same thing. You are going to suffer worst of all because you have lied about what the word of God is. God dis uh, Jeremiah describes in a very particular sense God's anger at them, uh, that the, what the fall of Jerusalem would look like. And he says there are two groups of Jews that will survive the initial assault. One would be those who try to uh, slip through and escape the Babylonians, and the others will be the ones that surrender. He uses another symbol there. He says that uh, there are two, he pictures two baskets of figs, one rotten and one whole. The rotten figs are those that will try to escape rather than surrender, and he includes, uh, he mentions Zedekiah and his officials and that they're done for, and the good fruit are those that will surrender, and they will live, and they eventually will prosper, and eventually will be returned. There will be restoration for them. Sure enough, reading ahead a little bit, when Jerusalem is, the wall is broken down, then Zedekiah and his nobles try to escape. They get out as far as Jericho. They're captured at Jericho. They're brought back to Jerusalem before Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar has Zedekiah's sons killed in front of him. He then has him blinded and put in chains and taken back to Babylon where he dies. Now, it's, a parallel has been drawn to the fact that the end of the entire nation of Israel, in this case it's Judah because the northern kingdom had already been destroyed, really the mark of the end of the southern kingdom of Judah was the capture of Zedekiah in Jericho. Well, where was the first place they got captured when they took the promised land in the first place? Jericho. So, a, to a great extent, the nation that we know of as Israel, the whole country of the promised land, started with at Jericho, and because that's where Zedekiah was captured and then blinded and taken off into captivity, that's where it ended as well. Um, and, and there are a number of different parallels like that in terms of the historical. You can see God reestablishing this imagery from the past. <coughs> we then have a scene uh, in the 27th chapter where Jeremiah, in, to, to symbolize visually, you get all this, this visual symbolism, to symbolize the fact that the people will be under the yoke of Babylon, God tells them to actually wear a yoke to take a, like a, a yoke, an oxen yoke and to put it around his neck and to wear it in public is a symbol for the fact that the people, it's inevitable that the people will come under the yoke of Babylon. Now, there's a, one of the false prophets is, Hanani, is named Hananiah. Hananiah claims that Jeremiah is lying, that it's not true, that they're not going to be under Babylon's yoke. In fact, he forcibly takes the yoke off of uh, Jeremiah and breaks it as a symbol of the fact that any power that Babylon has is going to be broken. Well, um, Jeremiah tells him that for that, you will pay a price. Yahweh speaks through Jeremiah to say that in less than a year, you will die. Well, in fact, two months later, Hananiah dies. And uh, Jeremiah is sort of reestablished in that. We, during this period of time, Babylon comes in, they take over the city, don't destroy it. And the first of the um, exiles are taken off. So in chapter 29, we had Jeremiah writing to those exiles, and those exiles included Ezekiel the prophet and a number of others. So he writes to the exiles and tells them, you'll be fine, You're, you will survive. Now, it'll take 70 years. 70 years was considered um, the, the, a 
time when a whole generation would die out. You know, even, even those who had first been born are going to be dead in 70 years. So your descendants, but he tells them, live in the land, plant, you know, get a house, plant a garden, pray for the safety of the nation you're living in. You'll be fine as long as you stay peaceful, and in 70 years you'll return. And whether you count it from the capture of Zedekiah or whatever, it depends on you know, which, which landmark you make. It's somewhere between 66 and 74 years between the time that uh, Judah fell and the time in which the people returned to Israel. So, um, or you could say it's from the time of the last exile to the, to the rebuilding of the temple, or you know, there's several different ways you can count that. Well, the Babylonians are controlling Jerusalem and uh, Judah at this point, but there is still trouble to come because uh, Jehoiakim, one of the kings, rebels against Nebuchadnezzar. There's this idea that the Egyptians keep thinking that they'll be able to defeat Babylon. Babylon in the north, Egypt, Egypt in the south, and they keep doing this. And right in the middle is Jerusalem and Judah. And so you have various factions within uh, Jerusalem, within the, the rulers of Judah, which are, they're under the Babylonian control, but every once in a while, like Jehoiakim comes along, he thinks the Egyptians have gotten strong enough now, they'll be able to defeat Babylon. So he sides with the Egyptians. Well, Nebuchadnezzar comes in, grabs him, takes him off into captivity, you know, for that. Actually, he dies and he puts his son in place, and his son gets taken off into captivity. So there's this back and forth that's going on. Right in the middle of all this, we have a very different section. The chap chapters 30 to 33 of Jeremiah are called the Book of Comfort, or sometimes the Book of Consolation in which none of this has the, uh, this judgment part. You know, all along it's been, you've sinned, you're going to be judged, and little glimmers of hope. Here we have three chapters, the Book of Consolation and the Book of Comfort, all of which are about God's intention to reestablish the people of, of Israel, Judah and the, uh, the kingdoms of Judah and the kingdom of Israel, the whole people of Israel, back into the land to restore them, to give them the new covenant. And of course, right in this section is where, in chapter 31, we get the beautiful statement about the new covenant which I will write on their hearts. And he says that I will call all of Israel to return. Um, and interestingly enough, instead of referring in these sections, these chapters, this section, instead of referring to Judah or Israel or the Jewish people as, as prostitutes who have, you know, who have been unfaithful to their husband who is God, instead it refers to them as the virgin Israel. It's like... In fact, all of the symbols for rejection and for um, idolatry and for everything negative and for God's judgment against them are sort of turned upside down. You know? And instead of it being a prostitute, it is the virgin Israel. Instead of it being you know, mourning and weeping, it is dancing and singing. And all of that symbolism is turned upside down as a way of God's promise that as bad as it is, and it's going to be bad, and it's your fault it's bad, let's not make any mistake about that, that eventually everything will be made right. And there will be dancing and joy and renewal and restoration. The people will be recalled. You know, the first part of chapter 31, which I thought about using in, in the, the favorite verses as well, or, is that I will, I will recall all of my people. This idea of the return to Israel. Remember, salvation amongst the Jewish people has always meant return from exile. That's the definition of salvation to the Jewish people is returning from exile to the land that God had promised them. That's the Zionistic expectation. God will call his people from the corners of the earth. They will return to his land, the land promised by him to his people. Um, and that's part of what the promise is in this book of comfort or consolation. Okay? Um, and he talks a lot there about restoring health and healing wounds. Remember that idea about, about sickness being a sign of, of idolatry and sin? and of healing being a sign of restoration. He goes into great detail about all of that. Um, he even talks about the fact that in the midst of siege, in the midst of oppression, that there is hope for this future. And so he doesn't, he doesn't suggest, oh, everything's, good. everything's fine. He acknowledges, even in this Book of Consolation, Book of Comfort, that there will be difficulties. But in the very midst of that difficulty is when they need to recognize that the hope and the restoration Chapter 33, he goes into specifics about the expectation for the great Davidic king, that the hope for the future restoration is based upon the idea that even though Jerusalem is destroyed, even though the kingdom uh, has been oppressed, 
there will be one who comes from God, who will fulfill the Davidic expectation, will sit on the throne of David, and that that Davidic promise will be a fulfillment of everything God had promised from Abraham on, all of the various covenants and promises. And, of course, we see that as very much a messianic um, promise in terms of that restoration. Okay? Now, we get, then get into the next section, which is specific about the failures of Jerusalem's leader. The first section, they do not keep their word. Um, the, the king, Zedekiah, and some of the nobility and wealthy people, apparently at that point, they had a great many slaves. And many of those slaves apparently had been put into slavery. People could be, uh, could be forced into slavery because they owed a debt or because of some crime they committed or whatever. Well, the indication is that Zedekiah and the other people who were in power had pushed people into slavery who didn't really deserve it because they wanted slaves. Well, Zedekiah, recognizing that he's not going to have to fight Nebuchadnezzar's army again because they're back at, you know, they're coming out again, he had, issues a statement that all of the slaves are to be freed because he expects that if they free the slaves, they're going to fight on their side to try to defend them against the, the Babylonians, right? So they free all the slaves. The Babylonians are outside the gates, and this is the second time the Egyptians show up on the horizon. The Babylonians turn to deal with the Egyptians. Zedekiah assumes that the Babylonians are gone and the problem has gone away. All of a sudden, he declares that all the slaves are slaves again. You're not free anymore because they want the slaves back. This is an indication of the injustice that existed. And they, had, they not only had forced people into slavery, but they had refused to follow the law that said that an Israelite who was a slave, they had to be freed every seven years. They had not followed that, that law of, of, uh, of freedom, you know, the, the idea that they had to release the slaves every seven years. Then in chapter 35, contrary to Zedekiah and the other noble people and, and prophets and priests who did not keep their word, um, Jeremiah calls forward a group of Rechabites. The Rechabites were people from a tribe in the southern desert region of Judah who had a long history of being nomads in the desert, and they had several rules that they had been given by their ancestors. For instance, one very unusual for this part of the world is they did not drink wine. You know, they refused to drink wine, and for them it was, it was an act of righteousness. Well, Jeremiah brings them into the temple area, and he says, okay, drink wine. And they go, absolutely not. And they say, well, you know, he says, well, you have to drink wine. And they go, no, we're not going to, because our ancestor told us we're not supposed to do that. And Jeremiah says to Zedekiah and the priests and prophets, says, you see that? That's what it means to obey what your ancestors taught you. And he uses the Rechabites as an example of what you're supposed to be like instead of what the people really are like. All of these vivid sort of illustrations, you know, real-life illustrations that he uses. Um, it was <clears throat> then in Jeremiah 36, we have the, um, God, this is where God tells Jeremiah, after 20 years of ministry, I want you to write down all of the things I've told you. And so using Baruch as his scribe and aid, they write down a scroll. Now, Jeremiah has been ordered not to ever appear in court again. He is a persona non grata. So he can't go, so he sends Baruch to them. Baruch goes in and he reads the scroll first to a bunch of priests. And the priests go, you know, this is going to be a problem. Apparently there were some priests that were not bad guys at this point, at least not completely. So they said, all right, let's go in and have you read this to, to, uh, um, to Jehoiakim. Jehoiakim. So they go into Jehoiakim the king. They read the scroll. And as it's being read, Jehoiakim has pieces of it cut off as it's being read and put into the fire. So he's burning it, even as they're reading it. And completely refuses to accept it. And they send then for uh, Jeremiah. Jeremiah, God had told him to go into hiding. So he's in hiding. Baruch goes into hiding. And God tells him, okay, rewrite it. And so Jeremiah and Baruch rewrite the scroll. And it says, and they added other words that God gave them at that point. That is what we believe has come down to us as the book of Jeremiah. The scroll that Jeremiah and Baruch created twice. We then have in, Jer in uh, Jeremiah 37, the final days of Jerusalem, 
when um, it says that neither Zedekiah nor his attendants nor the people of the land paid any attention to the words Yahweh had spoken to, through Jeremiah the prophet. They actually have um, Jeremiah under house arrest at one point, and the king sends to him and says, okay, the Babylonians are back. Um, does God have any word for us? And Jeremiah says, are you kidding me? You know, after all of this, you expect me to tell you something from Yahweh? You haven't listened to anything we've said. You've, you've broken every promise you've made. You've violated your relationship and covenant with God. You've oppressed those who were poor. And now you want me to tell you something that's going to make it better all of a sudden? You know, he says, not likely. Well, at that point, um, there, there are several things that happen. One, everybody's so frustrated with Jeremiah that they... Um, so a bunch of the priests say, we want to get rid of him, can we? And the king said, do whatever you want. So they throw him in a cistern that has mud at the bottom. Apparently he's, you know, deep in this mud. The idea is they're going to throw him in there and let him starve to death. That way they're not guilty of shedding his blood. Okay, they, they were, they had their standards. <laughs> um, well, he's down in the cistern and he gets drawn out by this fascinating character who is a Kushite named Ebed Melech. Abednelech. Um, Kushite means he was a black African. Cush was the land south of Egypt that frequently uh, was in control of Egypt. At various times Egypt and, and the, the Kushites were, were working together. And so he was, this, this man, Abednelech, was in Jerusalem. He saw that, that Jeremiah was down in the cistern. He asks that, the king to let him draw him out, get him out of there. And the king says, okay. The indication is that Abednelech the Kushites were known to be great warriors. He was probably there as um, either a military commander because the Egyptians were, were the only military allies that Judah had at that point. Remember, the Egyptians keep showing up, and the Babylonians go and drive them off, and then they come back. So they were allies. Abednego was probably either a, a military commander there to help, maybe part of the royal guard, or he may have been a military advisor. But he had some authority because he could go into the king and say, look, they've done this to to Jeremiah, I want to get him out of there. And he said, okay, fine, go ahead. So he pulls him out, and as a result of that, God promises that Abednelech will not die when Babylon takes over the city, and he doesn't. He's, preserved, he's saved because he's taking care of Jeremiah in this. Fascinating character, um, okay? Um, well, there's so much we can talk about. Then... Jerusalem falls. And when it finally falls, again, Babylon had had control of the city for a number of years and had taken off two lots of people into, into um, exile. Finally, because the, the kings of, Bab of Jerusalem keeps wanting to keep thinking that maybe the Babylonians aren't as strong anymore, maybe they're losing their power, and if we fight them, the Egyptians will join us and they will defeat them. Finally, Nebuchadnezzar gets tired of messing around with these guys. They come in, they destroy the city, they burn the temple, they burn the city, and all of Jerusalem falls. Um, when Jerusalem falls, everything that Jer Jeremiah had prophesied occurred. Um, there is the destruction of not only of the city, but the elders, the king, and his court try to escape, are caught. I told you what happened to the king. He's blind. He watches his sons killed. He's blind and he's sent off into captivity. All of the nobles are killed. They take um, one of the sort of minor nobility that was not part of the family that the, the kings had been. Um, Gedalia is his name. They make him the governor under the, the Babylonian control. As they proceed with this, um, a group of military leaders that were that were still hanging around because the Babylonians let some poor people stay, but there were others that sort of escaped and then came back. The, a group of them that still hate Babylon and still want to fight back, still want to rebel, they sneak in and assassinate Gedalia, the governor that's been appointed by Babylon, and sure enough, um, they, they know the result's going to happen with that. Nebuchadnezzar's going to send troops back and, you know, wipe them out. So some of the Israelites that were the Judahites that were trying to support Babylon, trying to, you know, not, not get killed themselves, they end up killing the people at Gilgadalia, but then they hear that the Babylonian army's coming back, and they figure they're not going to care that we were on their side. They're going to wipe everybody out. Johanan was the guy in charge there, and Johanan and his troops 
saying, we've got to run for it. The only place we can go to get away from Bab the Babylonians is Egypt. So they get ready to leave, and they force Jeremiah and Baruch to go with them. So Je Jeremiah and Baruch are forcibly taken off with Johanan and his troops to Egypt to flee the Babylonian revenge after their governor is killed. They get into Egypt, and lo and behold, they start worshiping the mother goddess of Egypt. And Jeremiah starts prophesying against them in Egypt and saying, you're doing it again. Do you guys never learn? Remember what I told you was going to happen the last time you were worshiping other gods? Now you're down here doing it again. It's at that point, we, this, our understanding or our knowledge of the story of Jeremiah and Baruch ends. We don't know the story of their death. The last we hear is they're prophesying against the, the people of Judah, who had Johanan and the others who had gone down to Egypt. Now, we do have another section here, uh, chapters 46 to 51, actually two more sections, are the oracles about the nations. Most of these are oracles of condemnation. And again, the reason this is here, and there's a comparable passage, set of passages in Isaiah, is because God is establishing the fact that he's not just the God of the Jewish people. He is the God over all the nations. And that he will control what happens to all the nations. So we have specifically uh, oracles, and again, most of them negative. Some of these, they say that they will be these nations will be wiped out, never to be heard from again. In some cases, they say they will suffer judgment, but will still survive. Egypt is one that will suffer judgment and still survive. Philistia, yes. Was this the same time where Daniel was taken out of Egypt? Well, oh, not Daniel was taken out of uh, out, of, mean, out of to Egypt. Babylon. Right. Exactly. Uh, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were part of the deportation. They were young nobles that got uh, taken out of uh, Judah and taken to Babylon. Because they were noble, they were young, handsome, smart, then Nebuchadnezzar said, I'm gonna make these guys part of my court. And he gives orders to his, his people, teach them, train them, feed them well, make them uh, you know, young princes to Babylon. And that's the whole story of the book of Daniel. You think they look into Ezekiel? Did they know Ezekiel? Possibly. Ezekiel was in the first deportation. I think Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were in the second. That wasn't too far apart. No, it wasn't too far apart. It was just a few years apart. So it's very possible. Now, um, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were in Babylon, the city of Babylon. There was an area out in, outside Babylon, a valley, where the rest of the Israelites stayed. And, and the, the mourning that comes with, by the rivers of Babylon, you know, we wept, you know, and that's, that's the story of those that are in exile. So, Egypt is condemnation, but they will survive. Philistia is condemned. Um, this is where the Philistines were coming from. Remember uh, Samson and the, the jawbone of an ass killing Philistines? Well, the only thing that's left of Philistine is the name Palestine, because the name Palestine comes from Philistine, from the Philistines. So, but they're gone. Moab and Ammon, which both were peoples that were descended uh, from Lot, they were condemned, they suffered greatly, there were vestiges of them that survived. Edom, which is descended from Esau, ended up destroyed. Damascus, was uh, condemnation was declared. Kedar and Hazor, which are both Arabic peoples, um, were um, judged. Elam, and then finally Babylon. It's all, you almost get the sense that all the rest of this, since it's almost two chapters, it is two chapters, of condemnation for Babylon, saying, just because you were the tool that I used, to bring judgment on the people of Judah, do not assume that you're okay. Your power does not make you uh, free from the authority of the one true God who made you. And in fact, if you, when we get to Daniel, and you read Daniel, or if you've read it before, you'll know that King Nebuchadnezzar at one point professes belief in, in fact, in two points, professes belief in Yahweh God. One is after Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego go in and then come out and find the fiery furnace. And then the other was when Nebuchadnezzar uh, puffs himself up and thinks that he is the ruler of all the world and there's none greater than him ever. And there is a prophecy that once he does that, he will fall. And he goes insane. You know, his hair and nails grow out. He eats grass like a cow. Uh, you know, he's completely mentally gone. And then later, um, it says that when you acknowledge God, you'll return. And somehow in that state, he recognized again. He remembered Yahweh God. He believed in him again, and he came back and became ruler of uh, uh, the Babylonians again. So twice, according to the book of Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar 
recognized that Yahweh was the one true God. Uh, and then his grandson, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, I think it was. No, that was his father. Uh, Bel Belteshar uh, was the one who made fun of the Israelites and used the, the royal plates and stuff from the temple to have a party with his friends, and he gets judged, and Cyrus the Persian conquers them that, that very night, it says, that he, that he did that. So, um, anyway, there's judgment against all these people, and then, interestingly enough, at the end of chapter 6, 51, it says, and here ends the words of Jeremiah the prophet. But somebody else came along, perhaps Baruch, perhaps somebody else, and added chapter 52, in which they revisit the, the actual fall of Jerusalem. They retell the story, and they add a few more details in here. But it's a retelling of the same thing that we got earlier on uh, about the fall of Jerusalem. That's the book of Jeremiah. Um, questions about anything that I said in Jeremiah? There's a ton of stuff there. All of this is available online. You can go back and look at it, study it, lay it down next to, you, to your Bible. Now I want to spend... Wait, wait, I... If there's no question, I want to add something. Okay. And I think this is worth adding. A lot of people would look at Jeremiah and think he was just some raging lunatic, that, that religious fanatic that, that was against his nation. But when Jerusalem, Jeremiah 40 says, when Jerusalem was conquered, there was a military commander that gave him free passage to go to Babylon and said, I will take care of you the rest of your life if you want to go back. And, and Jeremiah chose to stay, stay in exile with his people, despite the fact that they never listened to him. They threw him in a cistern. They put, put him in prison and all this stuff. Right. He stayed with them through all of that. And he, he was even, this, this general said, I'll, you come to my house, I'll take care of you the rest of your life. Jeremiah said no. So the ger general gave him a, a gift or something, you know, something. Yeah. And, and he stayed there. Yeah. In fact, Jeremiah... Again, the, the, the people of Judah, the kings, the priests, the false prophets, the general people, they beat him, they arrested him, they threw him in a cistern to die, and on and on and on. I mean, this happened a bunch of times. He was under arrest when the Babylonians finally conquered the city, and apparently they had heard that he'd been telling the, the, the people of Judah all along, surrender to Babylon. They let him out of jail. They treated him well, as you say. They offered to take care of him the rest of his life. He could go to Babylon. In fact, while he was still in Jerusalem, they said, pick any house you want and it's yours. Mm -hmm. This is the Babylonians telling you this. You know, you can live anywhere here you want, and if you want to, we'll take you back to Babylon, and we'll take care of you there, everything will be fine. And um, Jeremiah said, no, I will stay with my people, and I'll stay with them, not in the palace, but I'll stay with them in modest circumstances. And he intended to stay there um, until, the end. until the end, until they forced him, he and Baruch, to go off to Egypt with them. So he... Um, and it's true. We everybody then thought he was crazy. Everybody thought he was unpatriotic. Right. You know, they said at one point they said to the king, you know, you need to kill this guy because he's hurting morale by saying the Babylonians are going to defeat us, without ever considering the fact that if he was speaking the word of God, it doesn't matter whether you like it or not. And there was evidence <coughs> demonstrated that he was speaking the word of God. Um, and yeah, he was thought to be you know, kind of a loony uh, and unpatriotic and all sorts of negative things. But he was God's man, and he was faithful for 52 years mm. to speak God's word when he didn't have a single friend or follower, as far as we know, except Baruch, his scribe and secretary and friend. Everybody else was against him. Everybody with any authority, any power, anywhere was against him. And he held out. I think he's going to have a pretty good chair. Now. <laughs> um, now, the message of Lamentations. I'm going to spend five minutes on this, so you know, uh, it's not like I can start all over again. Um, Lamentations, as I said, uh, a lamentation is a song or a poem of grief. It is a sad, agony-filled kind of song. The Book of Lamentations is five separate laments, all of them related to the destruction of Jerusalem, the fall to the Babylonians, um, at the same period of time. And again, as I said earlier, Lamentations is not included in the prophetic writings in the Hebrew Bible. It's considered one of the songs of the... Um, of the Old Testament. It's one of the megaloth, which are the scrolls. The scrolls, there are five scrolls which are read at special celebrations. Um, the, this particular one, Lamentations, is read every year during the celebration of Tishab, which is the recognition of the destruction of the temple twice. It was destruction of the temple by the Babylonians, and which is what Lamentations was at that time. But then there's also the destruction of the temple by the Romans. 
And so the Book of Lamentations is read every year in, at the, the day that, that recognizes the grief that comes with the destruction of the temple. And it frequently in Christian uh, circles is read during Tenebrae. Tenebrae, the service of darkness, uh, on Good Friday, when you're recognizing the grief and mourning of Good Friday. Frequently in, in churches they will read the Book of Lamentations then as well. So these five mournful cries, the expressions of grief, um, it's interesting that these are poems. You will notice that 1, 2, 4, and 5 of the, these are the five chapters have 22 verses. The first two chapters, well, the, four of these five uh, are written as acrostics. Um, you know what an acrostic is? An acrostic is, is some, anything where the first letters sort of line up. Chapters 1 and 2, the uh, lament about Jerusalem's fall and the lament about the anger of God, um, there are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. Every verse of the first and second chapters starts with the sequential letters of the alphabet. So the first verse in these two books start with the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and there then are three, uh, three lines to that. And then the second, second verse, there are three lines, and it starts with the second letter of the Hebrew alphabet and on. Okay, continuing. Chapter 3 has 66 verses, and it too is an acrostic, but it has three lines, each of which start with the first letter, and then three lines, each of which start with the second letter, etc., so that you get a triple repetition of the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. Chapter 4 does the same thing. Every verse of that, uh, that lament poem starts with a, a different letter of the Hebrew alphabet. The difference is it's only in, cu in couplets rather than three verses of them, it's in couplets. And then chapter 5 is not an acrostic, but it still has 22 verses in it, the same number as the letters. So the structure in this is very specific and very particular in terms of the way that it's written. Um, now, why is it written like that? Why did the Hebrews go to such particular um, care? Sometimes they do, they do that because there was kind of a numerological fascination in the Old Testament times. There actually is the, the study of Kabbalah, which is the entirely numerological sort of mystical thing that Madonna and a lot of other people have gotten into. It's a Jewish mysticism. But um, even in the non-Kabbalah, non-mystical kinds of Jewish writings, there frequently is a strong emphasis on numerological and, and structures like that. But in this case, we think that it probably was created as an acoustic simply either to make it easier to memorize, which often was the case they did that, or else because by using all 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet through the whole thing, it's meant as a symbol for the start and end of all things. Okay, the lament, because they thought that, that at the time, and this was written at the time of the destruction of Jerusalem, that this was the end of all things. And so it was, it was a recognition of, from God who made everything to God who now has destroyed um, his temple and his people through, through the, the Babylonians. Um, and so it's fascinating in terms of the way that it's all laid out. Um, and I'm going to stop with that. Yes? Um, I failed to ask this question before. They, it mentions that the people started uh, cannibalism. Yeah. When was that part? Was that before the Babylonians came No. In? It's when the Babylonians had the city under siege. Um, they, they besieged the city. And they, they had enough water because Hezekiah, before the, the Assyrians came, Hezekiah had made arrangements. In fact, if you go to Jerusalem today, you can go to Hezekiah's pool, which is, there's a cistern underneath the city of Jerusalem that is fed by underground waters. They had enough water, but they ran out of food because the siege involved nobody getting in or out. And so people started dying, and, and people who were still alive started eating them. And so there was cannibalism. And one of the prophecies that Jeremiah had made is that you will eat your children. Um, young children frequently would die earlier, I mean sooner, and so parents eating their own children after they died. So cannibalism was part of what Jeremiah prophesied and part of what came to pass in the city. But it was while the, you know, the, the city of Jerusalem, I mean, if you've been there today, um, just the parts of the old wall, the, the old city that are still standing, it's a pretty formidable fortress. And so in those days, it was even more so, you know, a lot of that had been destroyed by the Babylonians and then later by the Romans when they rebuilt it. But you get this idea that when it was an intact fortress, um, it was pretty defensible. And even though they had you know, the ancient version of siege engines and a siege, you starved them out and everything else, um, the situation was that they held out for a long time, long enough that people were starving to death and the people who were still alive were eating their bodies. 
Okay, pretty bad stuff. The fact that Jeremiah had to remember stuff and do it twice, I mean, yep. can anybody ever do that unless you had a lot of help? Yeah, well, inspired by God. <laughs> but, you know, Carolyn and I watched the TV show Suits, and we were watching one the other night, you know, that we had recorded, and the, the guy was reading, he's got photographic memory. He's reading something on the screen, he said, okay, could you print that out for me? And if you're not willing to print it out, I'll just go back and type it up for memory. Okay. I was struck by that because I was thinking about the fact that Jeremiah, God gave him the ability to either remember it or God, God recited it to him again. Okay. And then gave him some more stuff, because it says, and they added more words of God to it. So he wasn't working just by himself. Uh, you know, he had out. How did he die? We don't know. He and Baruch were taken into Egypt, and the story sort of peters out. We don't know exactly what happened. So, yes? Do we know was Baruch a member of the same tribe as Jeremiah? Or? We don't know. We don't have a lot of detail about him. Um, interestingly enough, they've actually found a seal that has his full name on it. Um, and since he was a scribe, he probably would have had a seal. And so they think it probably actually was his. Um, but beyond that, I don't think we have a lot of detail. The names did not always tell you, you know, that no. where they came from, so uh, we don't have a lot more. Is that Anna, Anna also? Anna Thoth. Anna Thoth. Wasn't that kind of like, like a seminary for prophets? Wasn't that known as a... As a well, actually, it's somewhere where that was, uh, it's maybe possible. a school of prophets was there? I don't know about that, but Anna Thoth was one of the Levitical cities when Joshua, when they took the Holy Land, the Levites did not get a section of the Holy Land. Instead, they're supposed to make their living off of the you know, contributions to the temple and whatnot. But they were given cities and just enough property, you know, like I think that it's like it's within three kilometers of the city, to, to have animals, you know, to have the cows and stuff. But Anathoth was one of the original cities of the Levitical cities that had been set aside for the, for the Levites. So. Okay, folks. Oh, yes? Yes, quick. Was Jeremiah destined to be a priest? Um, well, before that could have been figured out, I mean, he was of a priestly family, but again, there were more, there were more Levitical, more people in the tribe of the Levites than could do priestly service, so they had other responsibilities too. But um, either way, I mean, he got called into prophetic service before he was old enough to do anything else, so I don't know. Could have been. Thank you, folks.